And welcome back to Zoom Back Camera. Um, uh, I have with me uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Christine Becker. Hello, Dr. Becker. Hi, Ricky, how you doing? I am doing pretty well, how about yourself? Not too bad, I'm holding up all right. Hey, good to hear. Um, I'd like to start with um, our first comment that we have at the top of, the fil or top of this show. Um, and I read it just so I get it right. Um, during these uncertain times that have moved us out of the physical Browning cinema and into a virtual one, our thoughts are with those who are battling the virus, battling isolation, battling precarity, and battling the fear inherent to this moment. And alongside that, we want to extend our thanks and appreciation to the first responders, medical professionals, grocers, public transit workers, childcare workers, and anyone else on the front lines. Zoom back camera is a small thing to offer, but we do hope these conversations about movies we love, and Dr. Becker loves this one, will buoy your day and continue the education, fellowship, and dialogue uh, with which we bracket our films in the Browning Cinema. Um, we have a tradition of shaking hands uh, before films in the Browning, uh, so feel free to say uh, hello in the comments and add your comments and questions along the way. I'll do my best to moderate, acknowledge, and bring them into the conversation. Uh, to let you know, there is a slight delay uh, so we're not ignoring your, your comments, uh, but rather we'll try and build them into, them, uh, into our conversation. Um, so uh, Dr. Becker, uh, Professor Becker, hi, hi, hi. hi. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, what do you do uh, within the, the film world? So I am associate professor in the Department of Film, Television, Theater at the University of Notre Dame. That's my official title. Um, so within that FTT, I'm mostly the middle T, which is television. Um, I also do some film. I actually got my PhD in film studies, but uh, when I got hired at Notre Dame back in the year 2000, um, it was to- Conan O'Brien style. <laughs> I tried, I tried to allude to that. Um, so hired to teach film studies, but help start a television concentration because we didn't have one. Uh, well, we had classes. We didn't have a, like a major for it. Um, so that's what I got hired to do. And along with others, including Susan Omer, we started the television concentration in 2005, I believe it was. Um, and now it's, it stands shoulder to shoulder with film concentration. So we're really proud of that. Um, I teach courses um, and, and many of them straddle the television and film uh, world. So um, I teach our intro to film class, which is called Basics of Film and Television, uh, Media Industries, British Television, Television Storytelling. I just started teaching our sports and TV class, which has been uh, real fun. Um, so that's mostly what I do. And then I, ha um, I also, um, of course, as a professor teaching research and service. So in terms of um, service, I host a podcast uh, called ACA Media, recommended for academics only really, but if you're interested in the academic world of media studies, that's aca-media.org. And then research, I have a book about 50s uh, film stars, excuse me, Hollywood film stars on 50s television called It's the Pictures That Got Small. And if you find that funny, it's definitely a book for you. Um, and then my- hey, it's the book for me. <laughs> my current research it's a great area- great book, I actually read it, it's a great book. It's, it's not bad, it's, you know, it, it, was, it was hard to write, but um, I have a real, um, you know, fond place in my heart, especially for doing the research. It was so much fun to research. You know, that part was much more fun than, than writing. Um, and then currently British television is what I look at on the side. Mm -hmm. And of all of those classes that uh, you've launched and created, um, anything stick out to you as a favorite, um, favorite, oh, class, favorite class from your repertoire? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was just distracted. I have kittens and one was just meowing. I was hoping they would stay asleep. And I think me talking, one of them is like, what's going on? Anyway, <laughs> um, hopefully they'll stay relaxed. Um, I love just about everything I teach. And this one real great glory of film, television, theater is that they let us teach basically what we want. Um, and so a class I started maybe six years ago is called Media Industries. And it was spawned by the fact that we're sending graduates out, especially to LA and New York, getting involved in the industry, um, but they didn't have the kind of education in the industry that say USC students or NYU students did. So um, started this class called Media Industries and it's basically a crash course in the business of entertainment of um, development, production, distribution. And I love teaching it. Okay, there we go, there's a cat. I hope this isn't gonna be distracting, let me know. There's nothing I can do about it, but <laughs> let me know. It's, it's uh, like the pastorals in Night of the Hunter. It was right. meant to be. 
Exactly, and and a cat plays a key role in the film. I will note. So, so little Coley here might be interested in making sure we address the cat in Night of the Hunter. Um, so totally forgot what I was talking about. Media industries. Uh, so it's a class where we spend about half the time just talking about what's happening right now in the media industries. You know the uh, things that are in the news and the trades, for instance. And then the other half is me lecturing about how distribution works and that kind of stuff. But I love it partly because it is um, in the moment. We talk about everything that's happening right now and try to make sense of it. And that's really satisfying, especially to take one news story and try to find the larger logic behind it. And then also it is the case some of the students in that class are gonna go to work in the media industries. And I kind of love the idea of equipping them with skills that they need. It's just really gratifying when they, you know, they've been in the industry a few years and they come back to me and say like, wow, that class really helped me learn what I needed to know. So that's really satisfying. And uh, given that you uh, you rip things from the headlines for your class um, in the media industries right now, um, or in the media industry, um, or plural, sorry, uh, what what is hitting you in all of the various stories that are coming out um, well, in the current landscape? Yeah, I mean the the honest answer would be all of the stories, just because there's so much. But if um, one thing that came up with um, my class, we were talking on Monday, I asked each of the students or 24 students in the class um, what story <laughs> they found most compelling. And it was striking as we went along how much were things already in motion before the coronavirus era even happened. But now it's just kind of ratcheted up to 10 or 100 or 1,000. So things like um, movie theaters and attendance at movie th theaters versus people staying at home and watching streaming. Um, or the writer strike and what will happen with writers and especially the notion that it's such a freelance based industry. So what happens when now everyone's out of work and you don't have traditional um, measures of unemployment for freelancers like that. Um, so to me, it's the questions of what were the questions we having all along? How are those exacerbated by the current situation? And then what happens when things go back to normal? And, and especially the more speculative element of what would have happened anyway without this disruption? Um, what accelerated because of the disruption? That's the kind of media analysis that I find really thrilling because it's not just looking at some data, it's really having to think through, and especially one other, you know, I consider myself a, a historian. Um, one of the fun things about teaching, for instance, film history or something like media industries is looking at the past to try to understand what patterns or what rhymes in the past could help us understand the present. Um, and so, you know, the classic one being control of distribution is control of the industry. And that's partly why the industry has been in such a upheaval the last decade or two because the internet changed how distribution works. <laughs> so, um, so that's a big question again. <laughs> okay, not climbing on the computer, that, that can't happen. <laughs> so those kind of issues of, <coughs> excuse me, what, um, not just what's gonna change, but what would have changed anyways, what wouldn't have changed and how can we understand all those mechanisms? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think there will be plenty for the final exam in your media industries class. <laughs> There's <laughs> plenty for papers. There will be no no dearth of fabrics available. Yeah. Um, and now moving to Night of the Hunter. Oh. I'm always curious for people uh, who are chatting and along uh, in along with us for this conversation, uh, if you've seen it before, and along with that. Uh, opening thoughts, uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, initial impressions. And for you, Chris, I'm curious, uh, any notable screenings of this film? Or, and with that, why, why did you choose this uh, right. for Zoom Back Camera? Well, so first of all, and first of all, I'm gonna cough and I wanna preface that by I'm fine. I don't have <coughs> the virus. I have a, like a three week old cough and I took my temperature before this and I'm fine. Um, but so just pardon me if I cough every so often. Um, so you approach, you know, those who you in invited as guests on this about, uh, and with question like five films that you feel like you could talk about off the cuff. And um, this was the very first film that came to mind. It's always the film I mention when people ask what my favorite film is, I always cite it. But I always want to add a little footnote to it or a subheading of, especially it's the film that made me want to study film 
or more, more so it's the film that made me realize I didn't, I wasn't equipped with an, enough knowledge to understand what was happening in this film. And that to me is like the, the urge to study film as you, or anything is that you need to accrue more knowledge before you can really feel equipped to understand something. And that's what happened with this film. And I don't remember the, the first time I watched it. I can, I know the context. So when I was, um, this would have been when I was a teenager, started to get, really get hooked on movies. Um, and my parents would go to bed at normal parent hours and I would stay up late and watch movies on cable. We had a VCR back then. So I would record them during the day. So whatever was on, um, you know, cable. Um, and then at night when they go to bed, I'd watch it, watch them. And I especially focus a lot on classical Hollywood movies. So old stuff. <clears throat> and so I was, you know, I became addicted to Astaire Rogers films and Humphrey Bogart films and all of these, you know, essentially kind of normal Hollywood movies. And then one night, again, I don't remember which night, but one night. Um, the night of the hunter. <laughs> it was the night of the hunter. The, he found me. Uh, <laughs> found me. Um, and I didn't know what was happening. And especially I think, I love to think back on this context that I'd be up, you know, midnight, 1 a.m., whatever. The house is really quiet. I had to have the volume down. Um, and I'd just be sitting there by myself, like really close to the TV. And this movie comes on. And I was like, what? This isn't like... A Fred Astaire musical. This isn't like Casablanca. What is happening here? And I just didn't understand it. Um, but there was something I found so um, intriguing about it. Um, I just I I couldn't turn it off. And of course, I didn't have the, like the internet to go run to. This would have been um, like mid '80s, I guess. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Didn't have the internet to go run to. I don't even know if I go to the library. I don't know. Again, I don't remember. But the main thing was I just, I was like, what is this? I couldn't make sense of it. And there's certainly things you see that you can't make sense of that you then just say like, well, that's not for me. I don't like that. But I knew there was something in there that was for me and I liked it. I just didn't understand it. And it was that first plant in my mind of like, I need to learn more. I need to know more. I need to, how do they make those shots? Like, why is everything so weird? Um, I needed to know more. And so that was that kind of the first impulse I can remember of really wanting to to step up my game as far as understanding film. Ah, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> um, and then going into the movie, it's not surprising that it was a difficult code to break because uh, this is a, a pretty strange movie. <laughs> In so many ways. Yeah, the, um, the opening line I have here from Sight and Sound's review in 1955 of the movie is that quote perhaps the first thing to say about this film is that it is genuinely strange unquote so that can be the first thing we say about it too um although Trafal also had a good quote he said it's an experimental film that actually experiments oh, wow. um, so i'm curious um how did a movie about a serial killing preacher man who terrorizes two young children get made in as a studio picture in 1955? Yeah, I, that's a great question. It's a fantastic question. Now, one thing, I guess a couple things. First of all, it's from United Artists, right? Which is not one of the, at least at the time, was kind of one of more, if, if such a thing ever existed in classical Hollywood, kind of one of the more indie of, of the studios. Um, the other thing, part of the backstory is, <coughs> excuse me, a good friend of Charles Lawton's was a producer named Paul Gregory and they were buddies and Paul Gregory, um, you know, Charles Lawton knew about the book uh, from written by Davis Grubb. So if you don't know, Night of the Hunter is based on a, um, a novel by Davis Grubb. And uh, he knew Lawton was fascinated. He knew Lawton wanted to direct. And Paul Gregory said, hey, friend, how about I help you get this film made? And so that's also sort of a classic Hollywood story and, and, and also a story of how um, uh, Hollywood isn't as diverse as it could have been is because it's friends saying, let's get your movie made. So. I think it's that, a bit of like the person in power, producer Paul Gregory, who can make this happen. And then United Artists being one of the more kind of outlier of the studios. Okay. Otherwise, I have no idea. I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, the movie takes us very quickly um, and introduces us to uh, Powell, um, who is a, a preacher out of a Flannery O'Connor type short story. Um, after this very spooky lullaby that's oh, that's too sweet to be like a Freddy Krueger lullaby, but not far off, right? <laughs> um, 
and, ones, yeah. yeah. And we get a lot of Old Testament thrown at us and we meet Robert Mitchum. Mm -hmm. And for you, that what is the draw of Powell? Like as a great, you know, movie villain character period, just yeah. what brings you into him, the star, whatnot? Yeah, for me, it's the raw magnetism of Robert Mitchum. And another thing I would do in, in high school and college, if I watched a movie by a particular director or a star that really captivated me, I would watch everything I could get my hands on, go to the video rental store. And so I had a run of Robert Mitchum stuff because I saw this and I was like, oh my God, like he's got it. He's got something. And it's it's also- it's, Sociopathy? It's, <laughs> exactly, exactly, a classic performance of, and it's not just like, making the villain attractive, which happens in a lot of case, uh, cases. He, you know, his, his, his sexual magnetism, his charm, his cheekiness, he's very cheeky. Um, all of that put together, I just found really captivating. Um, and so, and in fact, this, another thing we can talk about is of course, religious groups weren't real excited about this film. Catholic, Catholic groups in, in particular were concerned. And I think within the studio, there was an objection um, to the fact that he was too sexy, even as he was evil, like that combination of him being attractive and evil. And Charles Lawton fought for him. He said, I need him to be sexy. You have to get across this idea of how alluring he is. Um, and for Lawton, of course, that also extended to um, religion as this allure that, that kind of um, overwhelms you in a certain way. And so that would, it's just, and it's not even a, um, like if we want to talk about acting quality, the notion of um, what traditional good acting is and, you know, realism and codes of realism, you know, there's, there's overacting in places and he's, and he's kind of chewing on scenery in places. And that's why it's so good. He's clearly reveling in this, in this freedom to play this kind of character, which is extremely unusual in Hollywood cinema. So there's just something about the charisma of his performance, which equates also with the charisma of the character um, that I found really captivating. Uh, so we meet uh, Powell, and then we are quickly, uh, we meet Ben Harper, uh, played by none other than Peter Graves nice. uh, from uh, Cable's AMC. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, <laughs> the, the loop is set in place, um, what's going to push the narrative. Um, and at uh, that moment, um, when he promises the the father figure element of this film and mother figure element of this film's really rich and we'll get into that undoubt, undoubtedly uh but he uh is whisked away where we don't know where the money is and we then have powell meet uh, harper in one of uh the cooler scenes in the movie in the jail yeah um that is played you talked about these moments where it's really broad and that's where it gets, I mean, borderline failed seriousness camp, right? <laughs> yeah. when, when, when Powell, you know, hangs down from, from the upper bunk. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh, that's great. And great physicality throughout, but that is, that is, that's a great introduction for setting the plot in motion. Um, uh, we then, uh, uh, take the, the child's, the children's perspective um, and this real sinusoidal path they go through of, here's some trauma, here's <laughs> some people taking it away, here's some trauma. And when they hear the kids singing the hangman song, yeah. it's, I mean, it's one of those moments where you step out of the film, you're like, wow, uh, it's brutal. It's, that's a lot to throw at kids. Yeah, and then Little Pearl walks along singing it too, because it's catchy, right? And, and Little Pearl thinks it's catchy. Yeah, you just sop it up. Um, and uh, we are then introduced to Mrs. Spoon uh, uh, and Wilma. Sorry, I, I'm maybe showing my hand who I really like here. <laughs> uh, in the ice cream uh, shop. And there's this good mix of giving marital instruction to roaring train shots just going back and forth as, yeah, that, yeah as a menace and gender is going to be fascinating throughout this film and it's sort of i mean it really does start here in some ways uh how 
how did how does that work its way through the film for you? What how does it how does it come out? And feel free to pull from later points and whatnot. Yeah. It's one of the more you know complicated issues to deal with, and it's one of these classic ideas of how we look back on films from the past and what they might have represented back then and what they represent now. And so there's all kinds of lines where I cringe, um, and even including Lily and Gish's character, just you know, women they're just dumb, like they're just don't do that, women. Like there's all kinds of that cringy stuff. Um, even as, again, I'm admitting like Robert Mitchum, totally sexy, got me and Powell. And so the, there's those same kind of things. Um, so, you know, it's, you know, I like to think of it as, as complicated. I don't know if it is, but I think especially kind of working through how those relationships are working or thinking, especially in terms of how it's framed, where I think the film might be trying to do this, especially with um, Shelley Winter's character, what's her name? Uh, Wilma. Wilma, right. Um, with, with Wilma, the idea that she is a figure who is shaped by those around her and recognizing how problematic that is. Or same with then Mrs. Spoon, where she's talking about um, how she just sits back and thinks about canning rather than actually enjoying sex with a husband. That's clearly something that's culturally constructed around her that she's capitulating to. So I might be reading or trying to read too much into saying the film wants to help you recognize some of those structures. Um, at the very least, that's how I still find places within it where I can connect with it. And one of the, you know, I think of uh, narratives or devices or kind of ur texts that have problematic gender or problematic just you know, very complicated things to tease out. And one of them is fairy tales. Mm -hmm. And right away, uh, John and John shares a fairy tale to Pearl. He educates her through fairy tales before launching them down their own, uh, it's not really a breadcrumb, a reverse breadcrumb in some way, uh, path. And clearly fairy tales are gonna be uh, important to this. Um, and we have, uh, a lot of bucolic shots too. Like uh, we're talking about trauma and then bombs and going back and forth, uh, hanging out with Uncle Bertie in the water and has a, a very, uh, the, the scene shot during the day with John are quite different from what we're gonna be seeing, you know, further down. Yeah. Um, and for you, does this, it, it, does the time register interestingly for you? Does it feel like it's trying to inhabit the 30s? Does it feel like it's, oh, we're in the 50s, but sure, this is during the Depression? Or how does it feel located for you in terms of both the time and the geography? It's really, it's another really weird element of it to me because it also feels super modern, like it's shot in such a radical kind of way, particularly for the, for the mid 50s. Um, that it feels both very much of its time and, and not in a in a time at all. The also and I think that also fits with the fairy tale notion. So Charles Lawton, the director, he described it as a nightmarish mother goose. And I think there's something that fits to that. Like there's a timelessness to any kind of fairy tale, but it, oftentimes they're also kind of 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 a place of a time. And so I get that from this. And it's and it's particularly in the second part, it's trying to make allusions to ha things happening in the depression and the chaos of, of people just, you know, I love the idea that, um, and again, Lillian Gish's character, what's her name? This is Cooper? Oh, Cooper, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, she just finds these two kids and yep, come on in, like no paperwork, anything, just you're mine now. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a real off the books adoption. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and just ask John, where are your parents? They're dead. Well, okay then, let's carry on. Um, Here's an apple. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and then like the timelessness of, of Bible stories. Like it's just, it's such a weird sense of displacement, which again, for me, the movie works because all of these things, like none of the things seem to fit together, which to me makes them all fit together, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. But you have to do the, well, that's the, the connecting the dots. And then finding the center of those dots is like the calculus that it took film studies to figure out. Right. Um, we then uh, get a, a very James Agee-ish monologue, <laughs> and that is the love, love. Oh, I, I, I should have. Oh, this opportunity. 
Oh man. Oh man. Uh, the love hate uh, monologue. Uh, and uh, have a question here. Like uh, part of that monologue is Mitchum's voice. Is it altered in any way? Is he like, is he playing higher in the register? The, it just seems unusual compared to some of the other accents and voices I hear him do. It's possible when he does it the second time, um, when he's doing it to, to, to Cooper, he does it super deep and it sounds extremely performative and that's where she immediately cuts him off. So it might be a sign, and we already know he's, he's performative, but it might fit with that, that he sort of adopts what he thinks should work with each crowd. It doesn't work with Cooper. He clearly doesn't know who he's dealing with in that second instance of it. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was meant that he's, um, and, and particularly then a notion of there's something more endearing or more sensitive about that kind of pitch versus again with Cooper, he does the like, you know, folksy old deeper voice because he thinks that's gonna work with her and he clearly doesn't realize how unmatched he is. And with this uh, monologue is the moment we see Pearl's immediate um, acceptance of Powell. Mm -hmm. uh, we see John's strong rejection of him yeah. Uh, and uh, this really begins, uh, so in watching the film again, I was like, ooh, this is a pretty good edible complex film. And yeah. then by the end of it, I was like, <laughs> someone has written a book on the edible complex in this film yeah. uh, between John trying to uh, reject Powell uh, and forming female relationships uh, and Pearl in some ways becoming the agent who gets her mom killed, uh, mm -hmm. but still willing to return. So that that's that's out there, both the Oedipal and the Electra complex yeah. there with the with the two children. And it's strong from the back. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that, I mean, that could be a criticism of the film that it's trying to do too many things. It's trying to draw on fairy tales and religion and the Oedipal yes. complex and this and that and the other. But again, to me, that's what makes it a joy that the, the kind of throwing everything out there and to me all together and uh there's a notion like saying that this is my favorite film it's not a perfect film there's plenty of films that i like a lot that i can say that's a perfect film you can't change a frame of that if, if we had done a discussion of that i would have said let's talk about the conversation couples conversation the conversation is a perfect film i wouldn't change a single thing night of the hunter if i wanted to make it better I would change some of the scenes where the acting's a little clunky or, or too much. Um, there's some editing, you know, wonkiness. Mm -hmm. other things. But I also feel like if I made those changes, I would destroy the film. I would ruin the, the, the kismet that's happening with all that's going on. And I think part of it is because of um, them wanting to try, like, like, let's just try all of these things together. And that's, it creates something special, I think. Yeah, I don't think this could be a perfect film in a lot of ways, um, but it, it maximizes what it's able to get out of its approach and what it brings to a very unique story. Yeah. Um, uh, we have uh, then the picnic scene where uh, Mrs. Spoon is doing some matchmaking and a very good bass vocal perform like strong voice out of Paul, uh, Powell when he's singing. Uh, one of my favorite lines from the movie is when John says, I don't want no fudge. And the <laughs> says, you'll do what you're told. It's interesting, John is the one, like John is very abiding, but mm -hmm. he'll reject anything that comes into the sphere of like, oh, you're trying to hook my mom up, including Mrs. Spoons. Right. Uh, uh, we then get a, a, night, a nighttime marriage announcement. Um, and this is the point where if you start to watch the film through John's eyes, and in many ways it's happening already, you realize how freaky <laughs> this would be to live. Like, yeah. and devastating. And do we get children's perspectives in films like this? Um, often around the era, I, it, it, it gives such a flavor to it. Is it something that that you that you you have you think of around this time, or is it unique? Is it part of what made it char a charm? That's a great question, and I feel like you know, as a historian, I couldn't say because I don't know that history. I mean, I think of things like um, um, Alfalfa. What are the that kids kid show? The Alfalfa and 
Oh, uh, the gang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the that gang. What, whatever their name is. <laughs> no, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. It's, it's yeah. Go ahead. I can't. Whatever the name is. Little like, rascals. Little sorry, rascals. I was. Thank you. I was running so many little childhood gangs in my head. Right. <laughs> I was I, like, is that our gang? No, no, no. <laughs> um, it is our gang, isn't it? Isn't it also Little Rascals? Our gang? Isn't that the same? They're uh, they're all hanging out in the same playgrounds. Anyways, I think of that, or uh, my colleague Pam Wojcik has written about um, uh, you know urban kid films. I think there's some of those kind of things, but especially displaced from the kind of um, milieu in which you would use be used to seeing kids. And it's all so often I think that kind of urban the urban um, urchin kind of character. Um, this the um, pastoral. Um, version of kids. Like, I think that it's another way in which the film is just kind of displaced from what is usual. And particularly in terms of like that notion of kids perspective in, in Little Rascals, it's because it's kids only and they're talking to each other like kids. In this one, there's a visualization that's also very childlike. So they purposely made a lot of the, the mise-en-scene, the set design and so forth incomplete. And the idea was this is how kids see things they kind of see big things and they don't see a lot of details. Um, and so like, how, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So how the house is, it's sort of a, a really stripped down version of a house or even, and that that's like, even the frame aspects um, are, are relevant to that. So the, the courtroom they're at at the beginning where first of all, we see um, Powell and then we see the Peter Graves character. No courtroom actually looks like that. And so it's setting up this Just one picture of Lincoln this, and that's it. <laughs> all we need it's all you need for a courtroom it's like a high school play version um which you know it's which it is in so many ways (laughs) (laughs) um so there's i would love to see a clay high school production of night of the hunter by the way all right we've thrown the idea out there it's it's their responsibility to run with it okay the idea um (laughs) But so it's supposed to be from the children's perspective and there's a kind of a literalization of, of the visual landscape in that regard in a way I think that's super uncommon um, for the period because it's, it's always, you know, it was adults writing for children. And so it would just be like, let's put the kids on screen, but not so much let's visualize how they are experiencing things. And that's another aspect I think of, of the strangeness of it because that comes across. Um. And the strangeness of Powell uh, becomes clear to Wilma, that's my segue, uh, during uh, the next scene for us, which is the uh, unconsummated marriage. Mm. Um, Pulling either back up uh, some of the gender issues we're looking at, but that's a a powerful scene. How did that, Mm. how did that hit you? That was probably another thing, again, I'm watching, I'm 15, 16, don't know much about things, birds and bees, too much, that kind of stuff. Like I, that also probably, like, I had no idea what to do with that. The combination of, of sexuality and violence, the notion, again, for a film of that time to show Wilma wanting to have sex and just the sort of boldness of that and how, um, how forward she is, but also shy, like all of those kinds of, of layers to that. Um, and then just the, the visualization of that, that space, which of course kind of connotes um, a chapel and then him doing this, you know, German expressionist kind of, you know, uh, uh, hand raising to, to the sky. Um, although I might be, oh no, wait, I'm confusing it. Wait, wait that's, yes. the, that's the murder scene. Okay, murder scene, right. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, was, I was conflating scenes there. Um, but yeah, just kind of trying to make sense of all that. That's another thing, one, uh, one of the things while watching, I was sort of like, okay, what's happening here? And especially, I didn't have a context typical of movies to make sense of that kind of scene. Mm-hmm. And then we get a great um, uh, comparison uh, scenes that come up where, uh, Wilma has entered the revival, uh, which is, I mean, with the torches, the, I mean, it's a, it's a foreboding place. Uh, She, uh, it's about time she embraces the ills of face painting. (laughs) Um, And then, uh, and that's, I mean, if we're talking about expressionistic shots, that's one of, one of the bigger ones. Yeah. And then as she is embracing that, we find 
uh, the children who become aware of the money um, uh, with the doll and a great shot with Powell uh, as they quickly try and stuff the money back into there. Yeah. Uh, imposing over top of him. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a really, and that's a great shot because you have the two children who are in the foreground and then him at the distance, both feeling big because of perspective, but then moving in and getting bigger and more of a menace. Um, it's, it's a lot of, and, and them not being able to see him. That's one of the most uh, horror movie menace lurker thing, movie monster moments for me. And that's, uh, I thought that was really cool. <laughs> and then when they stand up and the wind blows and a couple bills, you know, blow right past Powell and he doesn't notice like that, the little sound design there, that rustling sound is really nice detail. I, I, that was a moment where I was like, oh, they're gonna, he's gonna find out now. Like that was, and it's going to be Pearl's fault. I was, um, so uh, I was, I was pleasantly surprised when we were gonna keep this, uh, keep the, the screw turning. Mm -hmm. um, so the shots in the house, I, I mean, this is back when now we're in here and John uh, is not divulging information to, Powell, who has made his intentions much clearer. Uh, I talked a little bit about uh, the domestic cinematography, um, or we talked about the domestic space now, but particularly the cinematography of the home, mm. the shadows and whatnot. How did that, um, why is that so powerful? Like, what's that pulling from? What's that, what's mm. that working off of? Well, the one of the things Lawton was drawing from was German Expressionism. So that the starkness, and I think that's again what, what makes it really stand out against other Hollywood films of the time. You know, it's also considered to be a film at least on the, the timeline or trajectory of film noir in some way. So certainly film noir is an influence. And of course, film noir was influenced by German Expressionism. Just the starkness of those shadows, the sharpness, um, the heavy contrast, the heavy lines. Um, those are the kinds of things that, that really stand out as, as unusual. And particularly within film noir, which was considered kind of a realist genre in terms of the shadows are justified by the fact that the lights aren't on or that the blinds are, you know, are half closed or whatever. Like they try to create you know, um, justifications for why the lighting was that way, but there's no real justification. Like no one has lights that bright that are going to create that sharp of a shadow in their house when most of the lights are still on. So it's, you know, it's clearly artificial, um, but has such, especially a tie to what German Expressionism was trying to do, like to create a sense that of madness, of chaos, of, of you know, deep unsettling um, feelings, and then somewhat of, of what film noir was trying to do too. Uh, and then we do get Wilma's murder, um, which is, yeah, like very like Caligari, like down to uh, the monster and in the coffin as she's laying in the bed. Yeah, she's gone. Oh, she's gone. But it knows it, right? Like she has accepted this as her, uh, as her trajectory. Like she knows, okay, this is the way it's going to be ending. Um, and this comes right at a, a very near the halfway point. Um, so if you, if you see the film in two parts, uh, if you're gonna cut it at, at its midsection um, or its back, um, it really is the, uh, it, it is the scene. That's when things start to change both in terms of the time and a lot of the acts. Um, and first there's Powell um, comically kind of denying, this might be if it's comic or camp, uh, that Wilma has gone to um, Ms. Spoon, who uh, is greatly disappointed that he, quote, turned her out of bed. <laughs> uh, a great, and uh, the evils of dandelion wine. And I'm a big fan of like any reference to old timey, oh, we made wine out of zucchinis back then. So <laughs> like both of those. Giving us a good quarantine idea. Wine out of zucchini, I'm gonna work on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, uh, a couple of hand wipes on that zucchini, stick it in the freezer, and away you go. 
uh, and away you go out of out of your house. You're gonna leave your husband. <laughs> and then uh, uh, a shot that you read a lot about, you see you people reference, which is when uh, it is revealed that Wilma's dead. Yeah. Um, how how does that hit you? That one, that that was the single most memorable image from that film. The first time I saw it, through the hundredth time I saw it, um, and or it's, it's multiple images, of course, which I had hadn't occurred to me until again rewatching it this time. There's multiple angles on it, which again is an unusual thing. Up to Birdie and then back down to her. Yeah, and and changing the the kind of the you know which way you you're seeing her, which again is unusual for Hollywood film. Usually a cut is motivated by action. And here it's motivated by giving you a different cool view of it. Um, and incidentally, it was shot in a, in a, in a pool on a studio lot and that's a mannequin. So that wasn't really Shelley Winters who had to sit there and hold her breath. It was a mannequin. Um, and then big lights above the, um, the, the water so you could see the, 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 the lighting kind of um, twinkling almost over her. And the mannequin, uh, I didn't know it was a mannequin, but that makes all the more sense why it feels so doll-like. Mm, yeah. Uh, when she's frozen, and then the seaweed coming in like doll's hair around her. Yeah. Um, yeah, you don't, you don't, you feel like she, uh, the realism of the shot is, it's the uncanniness. Like sometimes it's, oh, this is, this is, it's, it's, well, a mannequin. It's the uncanny valley of how close this is to reality and, it flips back and forth while also being um, deeply sad, <laughs> but uh, gorgeous as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, again, thinking about a Hollywood film, and that had to be at least across the number of shots, 30 seconds a minute, showing a dead body, a murdered body on screen for that long. That just, that was unusual too for Hollywood at that time. And originally shot with her throat slit. Yeah. And Birdie makes a comment about that, about her throat being slit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they covered it or put her hair over it or something. And like, oof, that would have been all the more. Yeah. Um, so now um, Wilma is out of the picture. Uh, surprisingly for me at this point, it's a bit of a psycho. Yeah. Um, didn't think she's going to go that soon. Mm. Um, and that's what's, that's the, the great thing about this is now you, feel alone like <laughs> they are untethered unmoored and they have and they're like fugitives in many way uh mm -hmm. so we find uh the kids hiding from powell great shot of them uh in the basement mm -hmm. um and it's the the evil stepmother meets stepfather line like storyline of the fairy tale gets all the more ratcheted up yeah um Go ahead. No, no, I was just agreeing with that, yeah. Uh, uh, Uncle Bertie, um, it's, it's interesting that he, uh, that he takes on the shame that he would be, felt that he would be convicted. Yeah. Do you know why that is? I didn't, that didn't, I didn't quite click that out. No, one could argue it's contrived. Um, it's also he gets so drunk, you know, logic is no longer there and he's clearly got all of this unresolved grief from his wife dying, whatever it was, he said like 20 years ago or something like that. Yeah. Um, but that is a contrivance that the one authority figure John trusts left to him just gets obliterated because he thinks he's going to be blamed. It doesn't quite add up, maybe except again, thematically in the sense that John has no one to turn to in authority until he meets Cooper. So then we get a, uh, a Sour Patch Kids approach with Powell, first he's sweet, then he's sour. Um, we have a, a, him tempting the kids with food mm -hmm. um, in, a, in a very, uh, now we've moved to the New Testament and just Satan directly saying like, here are beautiful things you could have if you, if you choose to do that. And when that doesn't work, um, John is smart enough to send Powell to the basement <laughs> once the, the jig's been up, but now it's really up yeah. uh, and Powell levels with him. Uh, and it, it was funny, and, uh, Rewatching this, by the way, I didn't seen this before, ever, and I'm mean, talking decades. Um, the uh, at this point, I was like, "Why aren't these kids 
finding a cinder block and hitting him with them. Right. And right as that happened, uh, there's the the crash, yeah. and they are actually, I mean, they they maim him in some or stupefy him. Um, right. Uh, and in talking about moments of camp and weirdness, the or expressionism, them going up the stairs when uh, uh, Powell is chasing them, and then gets his. Whenever Powell is hurt, he goes to a, an odd comic wounded realm. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, here you know, the, the arms raised like he's suddenly Frankenstein or mm -hmm. when he's shot by Cooper, that whatever that weird hyena yelling thing. Oh, is. that is, that's just straight camp. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Um, so the, uh, we have an unreliable uh, parent figure and Uncle Birdie. Mm. Uh, and uh, that then gets them on a um, kind of Huck Finn type adventure. Yeah. Um, and as they're getting away from uh, Powell, there's the traditional fairy tale oh, got to get through these scary, unnavigable, and difficult places to navigate um, for us and end up on the river and woo, we are suddenly in a very new uh, set design and look. Set design and then when Pearl starts singing and it's like the voice of an 18 year old singer, <laughs> like that's, that's, you know, that that is really difficult, especially for contemporary audiences to deal with that that suddenly Pearl is singing that song. But again, it's just, to me, that displacement fits so much with what you're seeing visually as well, this sort of dreamlike landscape and, and all of the animals sitting there watching them as if animals would be watching them, right? It's just, it, it, all of that displacement, I love the surreality of that. Um, any read in, we had a comment, um, mm -hmm. any, why the fascination with animal shots? Why, I mean, why the spider's web, the yeah. frog? Uh, the rabbits, you know, as they're going down the river. Yeah. So first of all, I would say there's really <laughs> possibly something I'm not getting, especially if there's anything biblical about that. I, um, I hope, you know, I don't get in trouble by saying I've not read the Bible cover to cover. So I don't know if there's some sort of allusion to that stuff, but I guess, so barring that, um, there's something, a notion of, of nature, the innocent, the unprotected. Oh, God, that makes me think of the, um, um, the, the owl swooping down and getting, is it a bunny? Um, yeah, it's a bunny. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, even a Hollywood film doing that, showing, and you're not showing it, they cut away, but you hear it. Um, so this notion of the vulnerable, those who need our protection and our you know, abiding and enduring. Um, so they are about to be ushered into that period the kids are. And as these animals are kind of sitting there watching over them, it's sort of like almost as if they understand that notion of it's a, is it a tough world for little things? Is that what- It's a mean? hard word for little things. I was just oh, looking up the quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like it has that kind of a vibe to it. Mm -hmm. um, but they, when they are on the river, gorgeous and there's something at peace mm -hmm. and it's also an intermission in some ways like yeah. okay here's here is your palate cleanser after a lot of intensity mm -hmm. um there's not a, a scene that i thought was interesting for a couple reasons but um isn't that integral but when powell sends the letter to the spoons saying hey we pieced out of here don't don't bother looking for us um it, uh, I'm fascinated by the idea that of this era when it could be, uh, hey, we pulled up the camp posts, we're out of here, here's a note, and you'll never see anyone uh, again. Um, are you familiar with the Bell Gunnis story? No. Uh, she was a serial killer in LaPorte, Indiana, mm. who would um, have, have ads for husbands. Um, and she would bring them into her home and she lived on a farm and she would uh, murder them and then feed them to the pigs. And, but send letters back to home being like, 
I'm married now to the, to their families. And they're like, I'm married now. Don't worry. Don't bother about me. I'm feeling good. And it was just, the chapter was ended. Um, so right in our backyard in LaPorte, Indiana, right. read that up. Um, also the, the distrust of um, uh, intransigence, I use a different word. Um, and uh, it's, I, I love, there's stories I grew up in rural Iowa where the only time you would lock your doors in this time, the 1950s, was when the circus would come to town. Really? Because it was these people who we didn't know and can't trust. And mm -hmm. so the way you're able to ascribe uh, bad things to these kind of unknown forces that are coming from within mm -hmm. is, is something the spoons are yeah, check that box. Yeah, we don't have to think about it. <laughs> um, this has been like the opposite of Cooper and Cooper is able to recognize all those things in society and the spoons are like, nope, everything's great. Um, you know, on the animals, I, sorry, I got down to a different note I hear. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, with spiders and frogs and rabbits and fox, those to me are all very fabulistic elements. Yeah. So maybe not biblical, but fabulistic. Like, yeah, definitely. These are who have qualities that Aesop wants to, uh, you know, pull into his stories or whatnot. They, that to me, it, it wasn't so much biblical, but fabulistic yeah. was the vibe I got from at least. Going back to uh, Lawton's idea that this is a nightmarish um, mother goose that fits exactly with that. Yeah. Um, they find uh, a farmhouse uh, when Pearl starts to look real shaggy. <laughs> yeah. Pearl went, Pearl went. <laughs> there's, there's some makeup work there. That's that makeup artist was working overtime there. <laughs> just like three, like she was had charcoal on her hands. And like decided <laughs> to like triple down on baseball paint. Right. Um, uh, and they find that farmhouse. There's a beautiful um, lullaby or whatnot that's sung by a little birdie in the window that you feel like, oh, this could be the Hansel and Gretel witch. You get nervous about it when they go into uh, the hayloft um, and that rest little one rest could be a siren song. Um, it's not, but then they wake up to Powell's sinister song. Yeah. <laughs> in the distance. Yeah. And there's this really great meta moment when John acknowledges the ridiculousness and it's like, doesn't he ever sleep? <laughs> well, I love the, uh, the actor. So Billy Chapin, I think is the name of the actor who plays John. It is so good because he's just watching there with this exhausted face and then just, you know, because there's a number of moments where the kids are, are kind of over, not over, I guess it's not fair to say to them, but they're trying, to, tr trying too hard to get that across. And he's just like, don't he never sleep? And it's just such a perfect, perfect little quiet comment. Yeah, and it's it is back to just horror and slasher film tropes. It's the like, where is the exhaustion? Like, why are these people always able to menace when it's required of them? Right. And so it's a it's a fun comment on the on what's happening and how how is always there mm. to terrorize them. Yeah, um, it's really another fairy tale element. It's 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 as much a metaphor as a real thing. Uh, that, that, and then one of the most beautiful, I've been saying most beautiful shots a lot in this movie, but it's a great one, of them in the farmhouse and Powell um, in the distance. I don't know how to show that. Right. Um, uh, did that one hit for you? Yeah, I mean, that's another one of the memorable shots. And of course, it's one of the more famous, um, you know, production elements. So to also, hit to get that shot, it was um, a, a little person on top of a mini horse. So a, a, an ancestor of little Sebastian, perhaps, was, was in this film. <laughs> that. Little, big little Sebastian. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's and, and of course now, I hope I haven't ruined it for anyone who wants to rewatch it, because now when I see that shot, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a mini horse, you know, a little person on top of it. But, um, but yeah, movie magic. Oh yeah, um, and uh, they and as they're every time they bank, there is this fear, like, oh, is this is this going to be scary? Mm -hmm. uh, but then they they hit the the promised land uh, with Cooper, and 
um, Lillian Gish shows up and she's, she's Gishin. She's giving you Gish. <laughs> um, so this is, so her acting, her style, it's, it's another odd uh, con- star in this constellation, right? Mm-hmm. But wh- wh- for those who may not know her, just like generally, like why, why is this so, why is this so unique and fun? Yeah. So Lillian Gish had a decades long career in silent cinema and is one of the, you know, along with names like Mary Pickford, like one of the most important actors in, in silent cinema. Um, and She's a hit girl. Yeah. Um, and not quite that persona, but certainly the, yeah, no, um, right, but. again, kind of more pastoral and all that kind of stuff. But mm-hmm. in terms of the list of, you know, top 10 most important actors in silent cinema, she, that's her, you know, and, and especially her work with D.W. Griffith Um, and particularly she was sort of on that side of the Mary Pickford sweetheart but less so sweetheart and more the enduring woman the woman who would you know do everything and 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 the mother who would do everything for her kids and and would you know abide and endure so to speak through all hardships she was that figure and so when she you know appears in this film and, and again this is something purposeful for Lawton to harken back to silent cinema um, but also then that that kind of that character she represented of white Christian womanhood, but not the Shelley Winters character, not the Wilma kind of susceptible, the one who really truly represents the power of, of spirituality and, and faith, um, that it, all of that baggage is represented the moment she appears on screen. So audiences in 1955 would have automatically be able to like write the whole backstory for her because because of their um, knowledge of her in the teens and twenties from silent cinema. And she is uh, very quickly uh, lets you know that she is um, competent. (laughs) Good quote, set up the stage. I'm a strong tree with branches for many birds. I'm good for something in this old world. And I know it too. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which is great to articulate that you know, I mean, it's a, uh, she lets you know where she's at and she's not wanting you to mind the goo gods. <laughs> right. <laughs> which was a very new word for me. I had to give that a, I had to give that a Google. Um, uh, but Cooper as, I mean, she is seen as, <clears throat> we get some backstory. She had a son uh, who passed away. Um, but also is is a, is alone and so is in the spinster role too uh but then a mother superior like mm-hmm. a or oh like a father flanagan like a yeah a boys town but um did the her agency um is the highest of anyone in the movie right like she gets it done yeah, yeah. And also that idea of like, and she knows it. I think that too, she has a savvy, she has an awareness of everything going on around her that other people lack. And that's why she's the one who's gonna go clean up all of their messes. Cause she can even anticipate that they're gonna come. Right, her reading of society is the most um, exacting. Uh, you know, she'll say like, oh, they shouldn't do that because like you said, cleaning up messes if it's children or otherwise. Um, she sees um, she sees the cards before they're going to be played, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, then uh, a sweet she's telling the story of Moses um, to John to ingratiate him. Mm-hmm. And with uh, but then Ruby goes to town, and I, 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 we have her rejecting. Uh, Boys her age, <laughs> yeah. uh, for Powell. And um, as a love. Uh, oh, smitten off the bat, off the bat. Um, so another father figure uh, connection uh, yeah. that's happening in this movie, um, and Powell seduces her with uh, flattery, uh, uh, ice cream, and uh, through his looks. So you have envy, gluttony, and um, lust. Yeah, right. 
how it was worked down the various deadly sins. Um, and then when Ruby comes home, uh, I think because Cooper, you know, there's that scene of Cooper spanking somebody or whatnot. Yeah. I, 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 I thought Ruby was going to get read the riot act, but Cooper has a very different reaction. Yeah. Again, she knows. She knows how to deal with every situation. So one situation might call for spanking, the other one, you know, understanding and caring or whatever. Um, and, and she just sort of, she knows how all these dynamics work. And she even knows how to play pal as well. Which comes up next. So Ruby uh, lets out the information that brings Powell to the yard um, and dubious from the start, uh, but also isn't gonna wait around too long before that shotgun, rifle? Yeah, shotgun. Gun, gun. <laughs> long, long, is it a long gun or what do they call that, the, the gun people, a long gun? Is that what you call that? Maybe. <laughs> It's like me and cars. I'm like, I, I, what car do you drive? I drive a silver one. Mm, that's a gun. Um, but uh, then that leads to a very protracted standoff. Mm. And uh, that is, uh, it's a day, night, day standoff with, in a, in a movie with scenes that pop out of, uh, like kind of pop the joint out of place, uh, a duet between her on a porch with a with a with a gun, yeah, and Powell in the yard doing it, it's like a round or it's complimentary hymns, right? Yeah, well, it's like she has the this I don't know if it's the second verse or whatever, like the alternate the alternate uh, the lyrics yes chant or whatever that you put over the top, yeah. yeah. So he's just singing leaning, and then she's she adds leaning on Jesus. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, and again, I don't know the hymn, so I don't know what's happening there. Um, yeah. Um, but if it's, if it's just, hey, we're killing time and this is the way we're going to do it till, till the next, but that is, it's a great standoff. And if you think of this now, I mean, this has been a home invasion plot in many ways mm -hmm. through various wiles. And now we're going by physical force. Mm -hmm. um, so to have that high drama, drama standoff, like, oh, we can't duel until the riverbed dies down or whatever, you know, like that there's a space between us and maybe it's, if it's religion. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, the owl eats the rabbit and he comes into, he actually invades the home. And yeah. um, uh, Coley's for <laughs> uh, ancestor, yeah. Uh, plays a role at this point, right? Yep, he's snoozing right now, so he's missing his big moment. Um, and uh, and makes uh, makes it aware, uh, makes or brings to the attention of Cooper where he is, and she shoots him. And then, great comment from uh, one of the the viewers that there are feral sounds whenever. Yeah. Powers, that it is a a whoop. Uh, a whinny, uh, <laughs> various W sounds there, whatnot. Um, and then, oh yeah, and he runs into the barn like an animal. Like yeah, right. again, that's sort of like the the nature element. Then the, all of that is stripped away from him. Yeah, um, and then the uh, we decide then to call the cops. <laughs> Come when you can. Yeah, <laughs> I think she, I, I, I believe, I don't remember the word, but I think she's going to say like, come right away. <laughs> but it's, it's almost like she, she was trying to, she knew she was going to win this. And mm -hmm. so like, she's waiting for the moment to actually um, do them in. Yeah. Um, uh, I might've said I have a favorite scene already, but I'm going to say it again uh, right here. Uh, favorite scene, John beating Powell with the doll, or with the doll, as the money is coming out and yelling, "I don't want it, Dad." <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a lot going on there too. Oh, oh man, that's uh, that's that's great. That's all there. Um, that denouement, that well, it's not denouement. I guess it's still, but it feels odd. The the court scene, um, 
again, back in the court, um, it doesn't seem to play out the way you'd expect. It feels shorter. It doesn't show you pout like it. Mm -hmm. It has an odd focus. Um, do you have anything on that? Well, and then, yeah, then the whole lynch mob scene comes up, which actually has echoes from earlier in the film of the religious revival. There's some, some visual echoes of there. The um, torches are back out. Exactly, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, for me, the thing that makes it all, because clearly that also, you know, they're saying something about bloodlust and, um, and now our executioner is like perfectly happy, not haunted at all to do this. Oh, but, he's ready. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That the, knife is sharpened. <laughs> the shots of Cooper with her brood behind her are just so, that those are just such lovely little shots. Again, it's a deeply unsettling context of this. Um, but, you know, her, her little ducks, you know, following behind her, there's something. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, that was just the most ridiculous sound that cat just made. Um, you know, kind of parading through the streets. You have a pal, you have a pal in the house. <laughs> yeah, maybe. That was very, I don't know if it was fear, I don't know what that was. Um, but yeah, those, those shots of her carrying the kids through the street, I think are really, because it really does look like mama duck with baby ducks behind her. And then um, a natural segue from a uh, lynch mob to Heimish Christmas morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Christmas movie. It's a Christmas <laughs> movie. Night of the Hunter is a Christmas movie. <laughs> um, that is, I mean, they need to wrap it up. Um, do you remember, you know, I haven't asked you much about the book and this is from which is adapted, but do you remember the book ending on this on this note or i don't remember i read the book you know after seeing the movie i read the book i read every D davis grubb book um i have no recollection of it and all my books are at the office which i'm not allowed legally allowed to go into so <laughs> it, it feels like it was something well actually i i did read that ag's original master script was mm. the book from cover to cover and so I don't think it's added, but to me, it felt like a coda that they were like, hey, we gotta have yeah. something uplifting. Yeah, it feels like a studio kind of. It feels like a note. Um, yeah. Yeah. It seems like uh, a nice description. Uh, Cooper hands out the gifts. Ruby gets her Guga. <laughs> right. uh, uh, John gets a watch, which, I don't know that there's, you know, early in the film, he sees a watch in a yeah. window, but I don't know quite what, I don't know if there's something he, he likes everything under control. I don't know if that is what it ties oh, into. Oh yeah. Yeah, reliability, mm -hmm. uh, structure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. And then Gish uh, dishes uh, some wisdom about children. <laughs> yep. Uh, they abide and they endure. How do you how do you hear that? Um, I find it tremendously sweet. Um, you know, it's it's very reductive, and it, and it does feel like a um, trying to put a happy bow on what's a super disturbing story and film. Um, but I I just found that kind of adorable. And again, the Lillian Gishness of it, super Gishness happening as she says that. Um, and especially like throughout, I love John as a character, I think, and it's just a really beautiful performance by him. And so how she um, kind of tries to mold him, I just find that really adorable. And so that last speech there, I find, I find it really endearing, even as it's gonna, you know, again, even as it's problematic, um, it, it works for me. And, uh, and if we think about Mother Goose Nightmares, or even just Grimm stories, or Brothers Grimm stories, mm -hmm. are children endure horrible trauma, yeah. <laughs> um, adults die, and they come out the other side. And so Carry on. It, it is returning that children's stories themselves, themselves abide and endure. Yeah. That how this is going to become a story, or it is a story that will be retold because it is close to um, uh, close to older texts and future ones potentially. Um, so that that's the night of the hunter. Anything else? Wrap that up. <laughs> Good night, hunter. Um, uh, quick question: um, As during this time, many people are streaming. 
uh, mm-hmm. television shows and you teach uh, television and watch a lot of television. Yep. Uh, a quick recommendation for a show that people could hop into? I see, you know, this is a question that's coming up a lot and, and I'm seeing a lot you're of- You're getting text nonstop, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're the first one to ask actually. Um, and so a lot of the recommendations I'm seeing are from bingeable shows where you can spend eight hours and watch something. So I'm gonna go a different direction. Um, there's a, I'm a big fan of British television and there's a British television series called Inside Number Nine. So it's Inside N-O dot nine, inside, and, the, and the number nine, Inside Number Nine. It's available on BritBox. So if you have to like weigh decisions about what things to subscribe to right now, I think, um, Box is a good idea for Insight Number Nine. It's an anthology series, so there's I don't know maybe eight ep- episodes each season, and each one is a different story, a different set of characters. Each episode, different story, different set of characters. The one thing holding it together, as the title said, says, these are stories that take place in uh, in a dress that has a nine in it. And I know that sounds like the loosest premise in the entire universe for stories. And it is, it's just, I think it's a joke. Um, but every story it's like apartment number nine or floor number nine or whatever. What they are, they are comedy horror stories. So they're often stories of intrigue or murder, um, and often funny or weird macabre black comedy, goofy twists. Um, the uh, people behind it, Reese Shearsmith and um, Steve Pemilton are the actors' names. If anyone knows League of Gentlemen, it's the League of Gentlemen guys. And they're just such good stories. There's some really, really clever stories. There's some scary stories. There's some hilarious stories. There's some really profound stories. Um, 12 Days of Christine is one I'll throw out there just and just go into it. You don't need to... Um, prepare yourself for any episode. They're all standalone. Um, and I think now all seasons are on BritBox. The most recent one, the fifth season just aired on UK TV and I think has alighted on BritBox now. But so if you're looking just, you know, you got a half hour, you need a diversion, or of course you could watch all of them in one season, mm-hmm. but they're not- But it's not long. built for binging because it's standalone, right? It's standalone and they air on British television um, weekly. Uh, this cur- current season, there's also been a podcast Everything has a podcast associated with it now, so you can watch an episode and hear the podcast. And this past season has just been a real standout, some really great stories. So it's kind of, um, it's short story tally, uh, short story um, storytelling. And so just really neat, captivating half hour stories, really clever, um, and uh, I love it. So inside number nine. Awesome. Um, well, thinking of things we love, um, uh, we have a, one second, I have to get my social scientist glasses on. Right. Uh, uh, did, were you aware that Proust had a younger sister named Becky? Uh, and she developed a five question questionnaire to determine if you love movies. Oh. Uh, well, he did. So there we are. Now, you know, uh, okay. do you care to take the quiz? Sure. Bring it on. Questionnaire, questionnaire, really a questionnaire. Okay. One moment. So, Chris, what was your first R-rated movie? So my first R-rated movie would have been American Werewolf in London. And I won't go into too much detail because I know our time is short here, uh, but it involved being left alone with my older brother in a hotel room while my parents walked outside to have a fight. So they left my old, and I would have been nine, 10, and my brother would have been 14, 15, and he turned on HBO, you know, free HBO in the hotel uh, and American Werewolf in London. I think half of the population your age has like a HBO, American Werewolf in London. Yep. First, <laughs> first <laughs> R-rated movie. Okay, yep. nope. Okay. Um, so what is the movie you would be compelled to buy even though you may already have a copy of it if you were to happen to find it at Picker's Paradise for $2? <laughs> Two dollars. <laughs> Excuse me, that was a bad cough. Um, oh my God, I'm blanking on this one. You even told me in advance. I forgot to come up with an answer for this one. Um, you have to, you have to cheat. cheat. All right, Hoosiers. Okay, got it. Uh, the best movie to watch uh, on a second date. So yeah, this one vexed me a little bit because I haven't dated, I've been long time married, so I haven't had a date in like 30 years. Um, I'm gonna go, but I was thinking like, I want something funny 
because I want to, you know, gauge the sense of humor in the second date, but I also want something profound that we can talk about and think about. So I'm going to go Wally. Oh. Maybe not funny, but charming or sweet. Maybe it'd be the more appropriate word. Mm -hmm. uh, the best movie to eat on the couch with pizza. Um, Included in this, what is your favorite pizza? Oh, wow. I'm a... Um, I, I like very spare pizza. So, you know, vegetables can go, can go away. Um, just pepperoni pizza, give me a pepperoni pizza and that's all I need. Um, mm -hmm. Pepperoni pizza and in honor of Peter Graves, I'm gonna say airplane. Fair enough. <laughs> and lastly, you're 10 years old uh, and watching American Werewolf in London for some reason, uh, but you're 10 years old and receive a screener from the future. What film most blows your mind? So um, uh, this one is maybe too obvious. Uh, not, I mean, not the film choice isn't obvious, but what it's doing, the film Searching. If you know that one, the John Cho film where it's entirely told in terms oh, of- Yeah, that would blow your mind. Wouldn't have been able to conceive of what is happening in any of that film. <laughs> that, would be, that would throw you for a loop. <laughs> um, well, one second, I'll do my tabulation. Yeah, turns out you love movies. Yay, so I won't get Yay. fun. <laughs> and we loved having you here on Zoom Back Camera. Thank you very much for your time and wonderful insight and for choosing this movie, which was a lot of fun to share and unpack. Thank you so, so much. All right, thanks so much, Ricky. Had a great time. Great. Have a good night, everybody. And a note that tomorrow we will be watching and discussing Lady Bird. We hope to join us at 8 p.m. Eastern. Have a great night. Love Lady Bird. Bye-bye.